We were featured in the inaugural edition of the Journal for Digital Humanities. Um, this is a, a blog post which uh, a, a public history site in Canada which actually looks at the, the site in some detail and compares it with a, another site you know, concerned with issues of race. Um, and we've even turned up on some syllabuses. Uh, so this is uh, a digital history course at uh, George Mason University, and you probably can't see it, but we're down there in week eight, uh, alongside uh, Lev Medovich, which is uh, <laughs> something of a compliment. Um, and most recently, we've actually turned up in a talk on serendipity, uh, which was actually uh, talking about the interface itself and how uh, different modes of browsing, using, uh, using the wall as, a, as an example of that. So this is all fantastic, uh, but of course it all brings new cycles of guilt uh, because you think, you know, we have to be doing more. <laughs> it's never ending. Um, and uh, we have uh, tried to do some more with what we can. Um, we've given a variety of, of conference papers um, and talks over the times. So uh, I've been harvesting more information from the National Archives database, the series and item information, and we've been putting it up on the Invisible Australian site. Um, and I've been doing a few more experiments, um, one uh, involving topic modelling. Topic modelling, uh, you see a fair bit of in the digital humanities community at the moment, uh, a lot of discussion of it. Um, topic modelling is uh, taking collections of texts and trying to find themes or subjects within those collections, trying to extract themes or subjects. Uh, and it does it automatically. You don't have to train it in advance. It, it uses a, a statistical model. Uh, it looks at the various texts and it looks how words are grouped together. So the problem I had uh, was that uh, while there are within the National Archives of Australia some series which are all about the administration of the White Australia policy, there are also series, um, correspondence series, which combine uh, correspondence on all sorts of topics, including the White Australia policy. And it's those series which tend to contain the most significant case files. So for example, series A1 in the National Archives uh, is a series from the Home Affairs, External Affairs Department. Uh, it contains 60,000 items, but it also contains some really important case files. So how within those 60,000 files could we find the, the, the files related specifically to the White Australia policy? So what I did was I got those 60,000 file titles, just the text strings which uh, describe the file, and I fed them through a topic modeler. What the topic modeler does is it brings together sort of groups of keywords which it thinks are related in some ways to form a topic. Now you can't really see that, but that's the sort of output that you get. You get these lists of words. It's up to you to start to interpret the, the topics, start to think about what sort of themes those words represent. In this case, what I found, what was really interesting, there are a lot of naturalization files within A1. Uh, so a lot of those will include the word naturalization you'll see. But if you look at uh, the other words beyond naturalization, you'll see that there are groupings, and they are groupings around the ethnic origin of the names within those file titles. So you can see some topics uh, com uh, bring together Germanic sounding names, some are Italian <coughs> names, and there is one which has uh, Chinese names. So this is that, that one theme which was particularly interesting to us. Uh, as you can see, there are as well as the names, there are words like readmission, uh, wife, passport, example, exemption, which all sort of indicate that they are files related to the White Australia policy. And we could, I could test that because uh, the topic modeler um, weights each uh, text uh, against those particular topics, those themes. So I could go and look at which files it thought were most strongly related to this particular topic. Uh, and I could relate that back to the, the file information. So I could create a list of all those files and link them back to the National Archives. So you could actually go and look and see what the files were and, and, and test to see whether they were related to the White Australia policy. So that way, out of those 60,000 files, I generated, you know, within, I don't know, an hour or two, less than that really, uh, a list of 1,300 files which we now know are related to the White Australia policy. So that was, that was pretty impressive and pretty interesting to be able to do that. Um, some other experiments. Uh, there are records, of course, relating to the, 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 the people that we're interested in all over the place. Uh, the State Records of New South Wales, for example, has probate records. 
Um, and what we did there was, uh, th and they've got also got an API, so a machine readable access to their catalog. So you can write programs that talk to their server and extract information, structured information from it. What we did was we went through some of the probate records and started adding, adding the tag invisible Oz to them, ones that we thought looked related to, to, to our project. I could then write a script which would go through the API, grab those tagged items, bring them back, uh, and then parse that file title. So that's the file title that comes from uh, the state records database. And you can see there's some structure there. There's a name, uh, there's an event, there's a date. Um, and they're, they're fairly regular. There's a few variations, but not many. So it means you could basically pull out the bits of that, that string uh, and save them into a database so you've got some structure there. So you've got documentation of specific events, some names. So you can start to build up that sort of complex data structure. I've also been doing a bit more of uh, facial detection work, uh, trying to extend it to more series, more records. Um, and it was while I was doing that one night, I had a bit of an idea. Um, the story is here. If you using Storify, I actually put together my process in terms of developing this. Um, what I thought was, okay, we have extracted all those those images, those faces from record search, and we have put them onto that wall, and it creates a, a really sort of new type of, of finding aid, a new way of getting into the records, one that brings the people to the front rather than the files. But what would happen if we went the other way? And we actually put those images, those faces, into the record search database itself. Instead of creating a separate resource, we actually fed it back into the existing database. So that's what I did. I created what's called a user script. A user script is a little program which sits in your browser and rewrites the contents of a web page that you load in your browser. And you can actually use them to do quite interesting things, uh, both in terms of changing the look and feel of the pages. You can even change some of the functionality of a page. So it gives you a way to experiment with web pages and start to think about what they might look like, about what the possibilities are. So I wrote a user script uh, to change the way that record search looked. So this is a page within the National Archives database, record search. And you can see here, if the file has been digitized, you get this little icon here. That's without my user script. Once you have my little user script installed, you load the same page and it looks like this. So what the user script does is it goes off to Invisible Australians, uh, it takes the sort of file uh, details and it looks for uh, portraits that come from that file and it grabs a random one and brings it back and sticks it in the place of that silly little icon. That's if you've got a list of files, if you've got an individual file, that's what it looks like without my user script in record search. And that's what it looks like with the user script running. So it gives you quite a different perspective on the records. Uh, instead of just seeing a list of files, you're getting a feeling for the fact that there are people inside of these records. A, a new way of thinking about the records and the database itself. So we also, uh, I mean, in terms of collaboration in developing uh, crowdsourcing, um, I can't say that we've made a lot of progress. Um, but what's been interesting over the period where we've been talking about this and thinking about this is that you know, crowdsourcing has taken off all over the place. So it's interesting to see what people are doing uh, and how they're doing it. And I was actually on a panel about crowdsourcing at the uh, American Historical Association meeting in January where a number of these projects were discussed. Um, and as part of that, I was thinking through what our approach was, uh, what our sort of principles were in, in relation to crowdsourcing. Um, and uh, m my first principle is really don't get people to do things that machines can do. Um, it's sort of basic, but it's actually really important. And it's not something that you can decide once. It's something that you have to continually reassess because more tools and technologies are becoming available all the time. Example of this, when, I, when we were first thinking about the project and the CEDTs, I was thinking in terms of getting those portrait photos out that people would have to you know, draw a box around the photograph and that would then have to go in and extract that out. Why would I do that now when I can run a facial detection script over those and extract those photographs? Similarly, with that tagging in the state records uh, database, since I did the topic modeling after that, so I'm thinking, why would we tag all those files when I could just get a dump of the probate records and run a topic modeler over those uh, and extract those groupings? We might still need some uh, help from people, but we could do a lot of work 
uh, with just with machines. And I think it's important to keep that in mind and keep reassessing the position. Because I don't think it shows a lot of respect to your collaborators if you're getting them to do stuff which you could get a machine to do. Another principle really was that we really want to deal with communities, not crowds. Uh, we were looking for collaborators, people who would come with us on this sort of journey. And um, so I didn't want to create just a sort of controlled space where people came in and did the jobs that we assigned them. I wanted to support people in their research so that they could go off and be working in the National Archives database. But if they find, found stuff, they could easily share it with us. So giving them tools which actually supported their own research but also enabled them to share material easily. So um, 